I'm just gonna, I need to remember you too. So when we do this, we take the big bulky base, the, um, can you just go the, the yeah, the book that, that would be very good practice. Um, one thing that's very helpful is to label the alpha carbon. And then one thing that we've seen is very helpful for E2 is also to label the beta carbon. Mm -hmm. We should, uh, for elimination, we should always label both the alpha and the beta carbon. Remember, the alpha carbon is the one with the leaving group, yeah. and then the beta carbon is adjacent. Now, this molecule actually has two beta carbons, but they're symmetric and equivalent, so we can just pick the one that's convenient. All right, now, um, who, who does it make sense here to put at the tail of an arrow? In these reagents, who do we really know is going to be at the tail of an arrow? The arrow's going to be at the head. Good. And now, there's something that should really jump out at you here. Who's the most reactive atom among these reagents? Who's our reactive atom? Yeah, but let's be more specific. Which atom? The oxygen. The oxygen. And would it want to be at a head or a tail? Tail. Because it wants to donate electrons. So the very first thing we should do here with the mechanism, I, maybe we've talked about, even if you don't know yeah. where to put both halves of an arrow, put the half that you do know. Well, we know this is going to be at a tail. Okay. And it's going to go to the alpha carbon. Let's work through that step by step. Now, remember, this is going to be an elimination, right? Now, this can act as either a nucleophile or as a base. But what is it going to act like in an elimination? Nucleophile, a, a base. What do bases do? What's the brunsted lowry definition of a base? Bases want protons. Precisely. That's the brunsted lowry definition of a base. They take protons. So we know that we're not going to simply attack the alpha carbon, because that wouldn't take a proton. That would be what this would do if it was acting like a nucleophile. Mm -hmm. If it were acting like a nucleophile, a nucleophile would try to join the alpha carbon. Right. Uh, but uh, we expect this, because this is so bulky, to be an E2. So where is it going to get the proton from? Well, a lot of people would think oh. it would take. I think I know. I, okay. think, I think. OK, on the beta carbon, there's a hydrogen. Yeah. And it's going to take that hydrogen. The hydrogen is yeah. going to give its atoms the double bond, and then the VR will be removed. All right, I think you know too. Okay, okay. good. Let's try drawing. That's hard to remember sometimes. That looks good to me. All right, now you need to draw uh, what the product will look like from that. Or in a sense, you don't need to draw it because this is what it would look like. Mm -hmm. Can you show the VR? As a thought process, it might help. OK. All right, so clearly the oxygen is at the tail. Now, because this is bulky, it's going to act like a base, not like a nucleophile. So it's going to steal a proton. And we should simply have memorized that in elimination, you don't steal the alpha proton, you steal the beta proton. All right, that's going to free up the electrons that are in this bond, so they can form the pi bond. That's the whole point of elimination. Those are going to be these electrons over here. Mm -hmm. And that forces the leaving group to leave. And so then the products would be Br minus, and if we were going to be complete, we could also draw that the tert-butyl oxide now has this new hydrogen on it. So now it's tert-butyl uh, alcohol. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's still a very important reaction to know the mechanism uh, for there. So it's good that we had a chance to uh, review that. You can see why you have to take the hydrogen from the beta carbon, because the whole point here is to make a pi bond between the alpha and the beta carbon. Yeah. So we need to uh, involve both of those. Okay. Um, now, of course, for a synthesis problem, you can get full credit without showing any mechanisms. However, you should still probably show the mechanisms just as a thought process, because if you're not showing the mechanism, you won't be sure whether you're really going to get the product that you think you're going to get. So it really was important for us to go over that mechanism over here, even though the answer just involves listing the reagents. Mm -hmm. So to review the E2, E2, um, you get an E2 almost always with a strong, bulky base. Tert-butyl oxide is a really good thing to have up your sleeve if you want to do an E2. You're pretty sure to have to use this on a synthesis problem. Um, and you should always label both alpha and beta carbons for an E2. In this case, it didn't matter which beta carbon because they were equivalent. And this is a complicated reaction because there are three arrows. Three arrows. The base takes the proton, that frees up electrons for the pi bond, and the leaving group leaves. So you just have to have that done enough practice to get through those three arrows. In the SN2 uh, and elimination handout on page one, 
um, there's a, a, a drawing of this mechanism, so you can uh, review that there, and then that would give us uh, this product over here. And so again, how would you know when to use an E2 for a synthesis during the exam? Well, if you need an alkene. If you need an alkene, throw in some terpenoid oxide. Terpenoid oxide is pretty much almost guaranteed to give you that alkene. So this is very helpful if you need an alkene that you can then do one of the new addition reactions that you're learning about. So you're, learning, you're going to be learning about a whole bunch of new addition reactions uh, today in our session, but you can't use those for syntheses unless you first have an alkene. Well, a good way to get an alkene is terpenoid oxide. Okay, so again, the thought process is we looked at the final product. We saw it had no functional groups. So we guessed that the last step was hydrogenation. But then we said, gee, that won't work without um, a double bond. And then we decided to put in a strong bulky base. So that's a kind of retrosynthesis um, approach uh, over here. You can't just hydrogenate this at the beginning because it has no double bond. Um, you might have learned one or two other ways that you could have done the same synthesis uh, that we won't go through right now. Um, I think lithium aluminum hydride would do it too, but I don't know if you guys have actually covered that uh, for this course. There's a couple other ways you could do this, um, but this is the interesting way for addition reactions. All right, so this is a good reaction to know here.